The Grumpy Gits are proudly partnered with NADEX, Europe's largest disability conference. Welcome one, welcome all, happy days. There ain't no meeting like a Grumpy Gits meeting. I am your glorious host, Adam Pearson, leading you to this cacophony of disability, humanity, and all-round macho greatness, and I am not alone. I am joined by the same three friends I am always joined by, because they won't let me make new ones. True story. First, you know him, you love him, and he's in Leicester, not Spain. How are you, Simon Sampson? I'm very well, thank you, Adam. How are you? I'm doing good, my friend. I'm doing good. Had a quiet week last week, so I could kind of, kind of catch up with myself and 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 relax a bit. Played a lot oh, of board games. I would like to say I had a quiet week, but I was in Spain, as you said. Uh, and just to let you know, for people who do get angry, I'm in Leicestershire, not Leicester. It's a different place. <laughs> <laughs> they are different places. G.I. Joe. Now we know. <laughs> Moving on very quickly before the North slash Midlands slash wherever the hell you're from come and yell at me. We've already seen him, Mr. Duncan Casburn. How has life been? Very well indeed. Yes, chugging along nicely, I think. I'm very excited about our news this week. So that's going to be exciting to, no spoilers, but big announcement coming up. Yep, very happy about that. And finally, the reigning, defending, Conquering. I know his iPad is broken, so it's technically not true, but I'm rolling with the gimmick still. Greatest editor in the world! How's it going, Chris? Yeah, it's going all right. It's just the wheels are turning. It's... <laughs> only, only all right. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I had a lot of like New Year's resolutions, and they're already dead. I, I, oh, I'm going to get in shape and I'm going to eat healthy and I think I've had like four takeaways uh, last week <laughs> I, mean, if, I mean if it makes you feel any better circle is a shape circle is a shape so you are in shape no oh, no. <laughs> no it's not a shape oh. I want to be okay it's not I'm I'm coming up to 19 stone. That's the heaviest I've ever been. I, I need to be almost shamed into shape now. It's getting ridiculous. Chris, you're also seven foot tall, seven foot yeah, tall. I'm well. not seven foot tall, I'm <laughs> six foot three. <laughs> okay. I think I, I saw some photos a few years back and I was like, oh and I, I thought I was I was quite large then, but no, it's nothing. This is this was like four stone lighter than what I was now. So yeah, I'm. Uh, I don't know. It's all rolling into one. This is quite a depressing intro. So I'm gonna shut up now. Chris, so. Chris, um, it's not. It's not worth it, mate. I've been on a diet for 25 years. It doesn't work. Oh, I'm on, uh, I'm on two diets. There just wasn't enough food in one. <laughs> Adam Pearson, BMI bang on 25, baby. I knew you would be happy. Happy days. Or Peter Pan. Can I go back to the the resolutions thing? I yeah. decided to make a resolution that I wasn't going to make a resolution and then realised in the process I'd already broken it. Oh, God. She's <laughs> <laughs> created a paradox straight away. Yeah, it's <laughs> moved down and fold in on itself. <laughs> um, it's true, we, we are now sponsored by Nidex for at least one episode. Who knows? <laughs> Nidex run the largest conference in the UK centred around disability... In and Europe. It, it, largest conference in Europe about disability and equipment and all around helping to improve the lives of, of disabled people. We've been cordial with them since since day one. We've spoken at their conferences and we're now officially partnered with them. And I don't know about you three, but I'm, I'm really excited to see what we can both do together now. Thank you so much, Adam. And yes, we are incredibly proud to announce that we are now in partnership with NADEX, which is Europe's largest disability conference. We were keynote speakers at the last event and it was fantastic. We had a great time. 
And moving on from that, we've uh, decided to partner with Nadex. They've accepted us and we've definitely accepted them and we're moving into a partnership with them. So to get a bit more information on that, what we decided to do is bring on Gordon and Rosie from Nadex, who are going to explain a bit about the show and what goes on. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Hello. Hi, I'm really good. Thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's kick straight into the question. So I wanted to find out, for anybody who hasn't heard of Nadex, what is it exactly that you guys do? What's the show about? Nadex is, well, it's 47 years old this year. It's basically an event for everyone. That's what we strive for. So whether you're a company and you're promoting a product or a service or a technology that's basically pioneering higher levels of independence, better accessibility, that's, that's what you can expect to see when you visit Nadex. And for visitors, it really is a community event. We want everyone to come down. There is something for everyone. That's really what we strive for year on year. That's fantastic. I mean, I noticed when we were there, there was yeah people from every walk of life. What I really appreciated was that you could listen to so many interesting people as well. I mean, you had Warwick Davis at the last show. There was so much to uh, add value to anybody who was coming along. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the things that really helps give it that uh, gumption is that everyone is so passionate working on the show and that's reflected by the visitors and the partners that we work with and the sponsors that we have at the event. Everyone really is truly invested um, so as, as diverse as we can make the platform, that's what we're that's what we're going for. What can we expect from Nadex in 2022? So we only acquired the event in 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. So we've had a difficult couple of years of not been able to run the event until 2021. So what we're really looking to do is just build on the success of 2021. We're really looking to increase the diversity of the exhibitors. Rosie and her team are looking to make sure that we've got a broad range of different products and services showcase that the show as possible and from my perspective as a content manager and actually building up the speaker program again I want to really build on the success of the event last year and further diversify our speaker program so we're covering all the important topics but actually also in integrating a lot of inspirational speakers um, and to give really inspiring talks around the challenges but also how to overcome those challenges of living the most independent life possible. Can I ask what was your favourite part of last year's conference? Well, I think I've got to say the Grumpy Gets, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to get him on that. I've been saving that as well. <laughs> but there, was a, there was a number of really interesting um, interview talks. Again, uh, the, the session that you guys delivered on the second day where you sat on a panel um, around sort of building back there at post-pandemic, again, I think was another real highlight of the show. But I'm looking to build, build on that last year. Last year was very difficult. A lot of people were still nervous about attending physical events. So it was difficult to attract all the speakers I wanted to. I'm hoping in July, everyone's going to be ready to go and uh, we can build an even stronger program. But I'm delighted to say and announce that the Grumpy Gets will be speaking again in the keynote theatre. Uh, we were looking forward to that. We had so much fun with it last year. It was we just did. fantastic. <laughs> and it was pretty cool too. It was so much fun. But really, it was really cool to un unpick those things and have that discussion and, and see how that unfolded with the different inputs from people. I really enjoyed doing that. What are you looking ahead to? So for, for the development of the Nadex, what are you looking to develop Nadex into? What is the future of the event holding? Sure. Well, well Nadex is constantly evolving. It has been evolving over the last 47 years. And while we are, as you said, the leading event for the disabled community, we want to build further on that, make sure that we're representing all the different parts of the community. And with that in mind, the next thing that we really want to stress is that Nadex is for the community and therefore we need feedback from the community. So we would be delighted if anyone watching today wants to give us some feedback on what they feel Nadex should be and what Nadex means to them. Then we've just set up a brand new email to for the people to email, and it is grumpygits at nadex.co.uk. The link will be in the description for that, so please do just go click on that link. If not, uh, we'll we'll put it up on the screen as well. I'm sure you remember it. It's quite easy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah like I say, events are, are all about communities, and we're not representing the community. If we don't listen, and we're committed to doing that and listening to our community and working with you to you guys to make sure we're building Nadex into the the world's leading disability event. Fantastic. Fantastic. Amazing. What would you say Nadex's mission statement is? Gosh, I think that 
the mission statement can come back to our tagline, anything is possible. You know, we, we truly believe that in terms of the development of the event, how much we can engage with the community, the types of people that we can work with, the types of businesses that we can encourage to, to be at the event as well. And I think that a lot of our passion is to become part of the, the, the wider conversation. You know, there are so many huge organisations doing brilliant things at the moment. You know, you have the Valuable 500, all of these big companies that are really looking towards, you know, what accessibility means within their business. And I think that Nadex is the place where all of those conversations can happen. So anything really is possible. And I think that that, that really lines in with our mission statement, I would say. I'd agree. Fantastic. Guys, I want to thank you so much for joining us. If people are wanting to register to attend the event or they're interested in exhibiting or being a part of the event, how can they do that? So you can to register to visit. It's really, really easy. You can go to nadex.co.uk and there's a big old button there to register your interest to visit. If you want to inquire about potentially exhibiting, absolutely please do. You can email sales at nadex.co.uk. All that will be in the description. So if you're interested in exhibiting or in participating in the event or just visiting, please do hop over, check the description and the links will all be in there for you. Guys, I want to thank you so much for joining us. That was amazing. Thank you for having us. It was thank really you. fun. <laughs> we are so looking forward to this partnership. We really enjoyed last year. We enjoyed what I, I days, what I found fantastic was it wasn't just informative and it wasn't just uh, liberating in that way and seeing all this stuff uncovered. It was entertaining at the same time. And I think that was a key factor. It wasn't a drudge at all. Everything led on from each, each other thing and the discussions were really important, but really lively as well. So join in, be part of it. We will have back over to Adam in the uh, original show. So with all that being said, it's time to delve into our ridiculous questions we had from earlier, what does six foot three, nineteen stone Chris Lee Smith have for us today? <laughs> right. Uh, first question is, which fictional character would be the most boring to meet in real life? Let's start with Adam this week. I I reckon Simba from The Lion King <laughs> because I don't understand lion. So I wouldn't know how to communicate with him. And no matter what one I meet, whether it's like the dumbass baby Simba, the midnight crisis, oh, I eat bugs now Simba, or the older, I'm the king now, I'm too good for you Simba, it's going to suck. So yeah, I reckon Simba would be well done. I think it's going to suck for other reasons that you're with a lion. <laughs> I think communication is probably the least of your worries if you're coming across Simba. That's why I have a BMI 25 and you don't. I think I do tell. At least I'll fill them up. <laughs> I, I, okay, I, apparently I'm there in that scenario as well. Um, let's, uh, let's go to Duncan. Superman. Wow, okay, that's controversial. Why would Superman be the most boring person to meet in real life? It's like, you know, when you go out for a drink and you want you want the mischievous sort of person, Bruce Wayne would be a good good evening out, you know, regardless of what's going on. You know you're going to have a fun time. Can you okay. imagine heading out with Superman? <clears throat> oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. Oh, no, that's... that's it, he's just too good. It wouldn't work. <laughs> I think it would be a ridiculously boring evening. Are you, are you hoping to break the law when you're out? or Not break the law, but it, it's just that, you know... Wear a traffic like, cone oh, on your head, or... You know, I've just scanned you and your blood alcohol level's 0.04, so I'm sorry, you can't have any more. What? <laughs> I'm not driving anyway. <laughs> you can fly you home. It's cheaper than the taxi. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to Simon. Which fictional character would be the most boring to meet in real life? Tell you what, it's going to be very controversial because I know he's got a lot. Of, he's got a big fan base. Okay, okay, it's going to be Groot. Groot, <laughs> no, oh, Groot. that is very <laughs> clever. <laughs> no, that that wins. That can, wins. It's not even a can, competition, can, and that wins. Can you imagine going down the pub? I am Groot. Excellent. Would you uh, Would you like a pint or half pint? I am Groot. You know, do you want a gin and tonic or do you want a glass of wine? I am Groot. I mean, you're not going to get anywhere. 
I mean, all, all, he, all he does is grows and dies. He has a larger yeah. now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean... <laughs> <laughs> you can't go anywhere with him because he's going to be so boring. You, you know, you know. What was your family like? I am Groot. How's the trees? I am Groot. I mean, come on. It would become a nightmare. You know, so plant your sign over there, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Can you leave now? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a, fantastic. I, 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 oh, when you said it's going to be controversial, I was terrified, Simon. Yeah. yeah I was like, he's, he's, he's either going to say. Jesus or PC Tony Stamp. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on to question two. What is the best and worst purchase you've ever made? Let's start with Duncan. Best purchase? Yeah. Best purchase, bar none. My guitar, my uh, my uh, PRS. I uh, love it to pieces and it is everything I've wanted in a guitar and it makes me happy and, and love it love it love it and oh. i won't say the worst purchase the worst thing we've ever owned because it's was sort of it stolen or no it was mar- it, it was something that was sort of came in with marriage if you like okay but the first car i came from australia obviously so i didn't read my car over i had a hilux i sold it came to the uk and for the first 18 months that i was in the uk with my wife we had a ford ka which yeah. for a big bloke's embarrassing enough anyway. <clears throat> she had emblazoned on the side two Tinkerbell pink fairies in silhouette stencil on the side <laughs> of the car and the back said powered by fairy dust. <laughs> I had to drive around in this thing. That, that qualifies. <laughs> that definitely qualifies. Let's move on to Simon. What is the best and worst purchase you've ever made? Um, the best purchase is a very easy one one um you've all been here um my house okay uh, by a far but the worst purchase has actually only happened about six months ago actually i fell for one of these internet scams and what it was is that i mean i'm, I'm a huge fan of jurassic park um i actually had a family member years ago who actually worked on a t-rex dinosaur on the film wow. and yeah so i thought what it was is there was this video on facebook where it showed this wonderful mechanical t-rex cost you know 80 quid okay um you pay through it with paypal arrives within two weeks from china and what arrived was this tiny little dinosaur about that big oh no <laughs> <laughs> i think yeah it could fit in a teacup scam, haven't they <laughs> they've bought something and it yeah. turns up and it's it's tiny let's move on to adam what is the best and worst purchase you've ever made i'm a little bit of a consumerist so my my best purchase is normally whatever i've bought most recently or whatever i'm using <laughs> most i very rarely get sentimental okay. um about my property so at the moment it's probably <laughs> the, the iphone okay what's your worst but, but the worst thing i've ever bought but for the best reason so it, it's this weird kind of am i ashamed that i bought it yes do i regret buying it no I'm i I, I, oh, it is great. It is great. I bought 72 copies wholesale of Waterworld on VHS oh, that's in, 20, in 2005. <laughs> Why? I had someone at school who used to bully me a lot. And I know for a fact Waterworld is his least favourite film of all time because some people don't take their security on Facebook seriously at all. <laughs> I sent him to his house a copy of Waterworld on VHS for a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, that's brilliant. Mm. <laughs> that's, a, that's an amazing idea. <laughs> Did he ever find and out it was you? Uh, no. oh, that... And slowly watch him unravel <laughs> on Facebook. Oh, that's going to be in the Sun newspaper this week. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's going to know. He's going to know. Uh, let's move on to question three. If you had to change your first name, what would you change it to and why? Uh, let's go with Simon this time. I don't know why. I've got no reason behind it. I've always liked Sebastian. Or when I was younger... 
I always wanted to change it to Wesley for two reasons. One, I was obsessed with Star Trek The Next Generation when I was growing up. <laughs> uh, and I, one of my, <laughs> I was a big fan of Wesley Crush. Yeah? Uh, and the other one is my granddad's middle name was Wesley as well, so I could kind of get away with it. Uh, we'll move on to Adam. Corbin. Corbin. Yeah. Corbin Pearson. Corbin Henry Pearson. And why would you change it to that? Is there a gag I'm not getting here? or? No, 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 no. I just really like the fifth element. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Dallas Corbin flew over. Jeremy Corbin is there. <laughs> yeah, I, I was trying to put it together. Duncan, what uh, if you had to change your first name? What would you change it to, and why? Oh, I want to preface this with a story. I worked in a phone, a phone company uh, way back when, and we had a guy came in and and he changed his name at Depot. He had to bring in the forms to prove. So that we could change his account details over. Okay. He came to the office. His name was a relatively normal name. I'm going to say it, I won't say his name in case, but it was like John Smith, that kind of ordinary name. Okay. He changed it. His first name was spelled Y O R. Yep. Second name was spelled F A R Q U I N. I've lost it already. Farquhar. <laughs> oh right, yeah, yeah. Last name G O R J O S. And he legally changed his name to this. So it was your fucking gorgeous. Oh. I'm convinced you it was a great To your one. fucking gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> it only works if they ask him his name. <laughs> it's exactly it. <laughs> and they probably won't believe him and walk away from him Which for being so forward. <laughs> <laughs> it's just fire. And you, you, you try to act professionally and you just want to slap the guy on the face. So, it's awful. Am I am I getting this right? You would want to change your name. No. To, okay. I would not change my name. No, I would change my name to a Professor. Professor. Because it's gonna get um, you in everywhere. Professor. <laughs> Every reservation you make, Professor Casburn. Oh, oh, oh Professor. <laughs> and that is the end of ridiculous questions. So I suppose we better move on and and talk about some some stuff. I'm gonna, Mister Mister Professor Casburn, um, what is your story this this week? Well, as as we know, I'm Australian, and I really, yeah, I know it's it's I've kept it well secret. You can't tell by my accent or anything. Um, but uh, I I have been riveted by what's going on in Australia this week. We've, Novak Djokovic and the whole rigmarole that's developing there <laughs> and it's not you know directly related to disability and stuff but it's it is related to general health I think mm. that, yeah, <laughs> that all this has happened and what's pissed me off most is the backtracking that the Australian government keep doing it's not the fact that he's <laughs> he's done this and he you know I, I actually thought great they're actually standing up for it you know that's really good then it was no they're not and he's this whole back and forth and the whole, it just snowballed into this stupid thing until so they finally did say, right, no, off you go. And even then they said three years, but it might not be three years. It just depends. And, you know, it's like, oh, just, whereas the French have now come out today and it's like, well, he's not coming here either. <laughs> they aren't messing about though, the French. No, they are they? Direct with it. No. <laughs> well, they, they turned around and said they're going to make it. Uh, can't remember the exact words, but it was along the lines of uh, the a- anti-vaxxers, the people haven't been vaccinated without a, a genuine reason. They're going to make their life hell for them. That's what he said. I'll have to get the quote. I, it, it, I'm obviously uh, say it in the words that I remember, but um, no, he, along those lines anyway. But uh, I think it's been a farcical. Yeah, it's it's the anti-vax thing again. I, I get so angry when I when I discuss it. I, I, don't, I don't want to talk too long about it because it just makes me so angry. If they haven't been vaxxed now, they can't be convinced. Some people, you have to remember, some people are exempt from it as well. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got a friend, a very close friend, who has a severe, I mean, we're talking about a severe, she actually died uh, for like two and a half minutes. She's got a severe heart condition. And there's a, there was a tragic story where her someone in the, her son's school died after having the ejection uh, of a heart, because he had a heart issue as well. So she's actually exempt from having the actual vaccination. And that's, and she, you know, because of that, she would 
she's allowed to enter Australia because she is medically exempt. There are genuine people out there who cannot have the vaccination for safety concerns. And the other thing is as well, if you are a celebrity, a well-known person, your job is to, you, you are a public figure. Yeah. And, you know, there's a global pandemic and you say, oh, I've done my own research. And then you ask in what lab, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they've, done no, they've done no research. At all. They've, they've, they've gone onto social media and said, what does social media say about this vaccination thing? What, you know, what research have you done in the lab? None whatsoever. They've just read it on, a, on someone's blog. And, you know, as a world number one tennis star, you would have thought you would like to protect <clears throat> the public rather than put them at risk. And that's and what really got you, me. What, this whole thing, what really got my goat about the whole thing was it came out that he tested positive for COVID and then yeah. was mixing with people and it, the next yeah. day. And it's like, that, that's just a complete disregard. For others, that's not hmm. you know that's not even getting the science value. No. That's just can't be bothered. And I don't care. And that's the irresponsible level of what he did. And I just think you know, grow up, get vaccinated. You should get vaccinated. Everyone in the world is getting vaccinated, of course, unless you're exempt. You know, and you have a role to play, not just as a tennis star, but as an inspiration for millions of people around the world. And you doing what you've done has not only damaged his career, I think it's potentially finished his career. Absolutely. Well, I, I think also, that's true. What, what, what gets me is, sure, people have, have a choice. And I, if I had to come down on whether I was like pro or anti-mandate, I'd probably say I was anti-mandate. Anti but a lot of the arguments now are, oh, we're using someone's medical status to determine their, their freedoms. And I hate to break it to you, that's been happening to disabled people for decades. Yeah. And I haven't heard, yeah. and, I ha and I didn't hear nobody about Djokovic say shit all then. <laughs> so you can take that argument and shove it in your hole. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the arguments they come out with, like um, the, the banging on about myo myocarditis and that it, it affects children more, that they're more likely to have heart complications from having the vaccine or complications in general from having the vaccine than they would catching COVID. But it was pretty, I think it was on the Joe Rogan podcast and he had a gent on there. Uh, I think I'll find the clip. In fact, it was on, it was on TikTok. And basically uh, Joe Rogan said that, well, look, kids under the age, I think it was 15. Um, basically, look, why should they get it? Because uh, the risk is higher if they get the vaccine for myocarditis. And the guy turned around and said, well, no, that's actually wrong. You're more likely to have heart issues catching COVID uh, with myocarditis than it would be the vaccine. <coughs> and he turned around and went, no, that's that's not right. Can, can we look that up? Can we look that up? They looked it up and Jeff Rogan was wrong. <laughs> For young boys in particular, there's an adverse risk associated with the vaccine. It's like yes. a two to four fold increase in the instances of myocarditis. Yes, but you know what the hospitalization. You know that there's an increased risk of myocarditis in among that age cohort from getting covid as well, which exceeds mm -hmm. the risk of myocarditis from the vaccine. I don't think that's true. Let's look that up because I don't think that's true. <laughs> there's myocarditis more common after covid-19 infection than vaccination. But is this with children? Yeah, we're talking about young people. Men and boys aged under 30 after this is what it says here. With, with children is the issue. Well, no, we were talking about 15-year-olds. Well, we're talking about young children. Male child. Yes, 12 to 17. Doesn't matter. 12 to 17, more likely to develop myocarditis with three months of catching COVID at a rate of 450 cases per million infection. This compares to 67 cases of myocarditis per million at the same time following their second dose of Pfizer. Yeah, so you're about eight times likely to get myocarditis from getting COVID mm -hmm. than from mm -hmm. getting the vaccine. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Now, that, that is said. not what I've read before. <laughs> <laughs> but you're more likely to have heart <laughs> <I> issues. <know. laughs> you're more likely to have heart, heart issues, myocarditis, if you catch COVID than you are with the vaccine. But you mm. see it. You see it everywhere. And there's people that would watch that and then just fly out the gate. It's it's just getting infuriating now, and it it, it kind of makes me angry that these people it, they take all this disinformation. It's like the internet now with this. It just reminds me of that drunk guy at the end of the pub bar that tells the same joke or the same piece of information to everybody that walks in. 
this is what the internet is now. It's it, yeah. it makes me so angry. It's like back mm. in the day when when your mate would be like, "Oh, there's a cheating Pokemon Red to get Mewtwo." Like my uncle's done it, but he's only done it once. He tried <laughs> to show me, but it wouldn't work. But it's it's genuinely a thing. If you just <laughs> run round run round the truck in in the thing, and then eventually Mewtwo goes ah, and you go ah, mm. and then you catch him. My uncle definitely did it. <laughs> but it's the sad reality of today's world. We're just battered with misinformation that the movement that says that there's a flat earth still has traction. I know. It's oh, yeah. Right. Uh, what happened? Um, we used to call these people out. We used to. Oh, God. Mm. It makes me so angry. We used to call them out. They used to be berated. And uh, as much as I hate bullying and stuff, it, it used to stop that disinformation. And I get it. Flat earth and all that, it, it's kind of it doesn't bother anybody really but when it comes to something like the vaccine that saves lives now there's yeah. an issue okay and now there's about, an issue it's about looking after others and that's what it's, you know, I, I, there's a famous guitarist who i was a big fan of until very recently yeah me been, too taken this whole thing and, and turned on it and he's become he's making profit from being an anti-vaxxer and it's like mm. this is actually about other people and yeah. it's about looking after the vulnerable and making sure, you know, you might get some side effects from a, <coughs> kind of a, a few days and then it's done. What you're doing is stopping help, you know, stopping the spread to pass it on to others who may not have the option, who may not be able to be vaccinated because they have other conditions, who may not be well enough to fight off the virus and are likely to really suffer from it. It's about others and it's mm. it, the whole thing is so insular. And I, I really dislike mm -hmm. that. That's that's another thing, though, is that we seem to forget, and I think a lot of people do, is the mind of these people that have been vulnerable to COVID, the fear that they must be living under, that if they catch this, that it's not just going to be bad, they could potentially die. And then you've got these young people who are fit, healthy, some, some of them gym goers who go, well, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm young. I'm, I'm healthy. I, d I don't need this. Can you it. imagine the anger and the fear bubbling up, knowing that this could take your life because of that person? Yep. I mean, can we go back to the flat earthers for just one second? Who oh, at, put out the famous tweet a couple of years ago, who's saying we now have thousands of followers around the globe. <laughs> I mean, that's the, like the anti-vaxxers, what we've got today. That's the equivalent of the anti-vaxxers today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But also bringing it bringing it back to Djokovic, just like the pure arrogance. It, it's similar with with um our, our glorious leader for now. I don't know when this is going to go out. Um, <laughs> Boris Johnson. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I I I don't have to do that because I'm I'm Novak effing Djokovic. Well, it turns out Novak, you do. Novak Djokovic, if you're watching this, congratulations, you've become the first tennis player ever to get eliminated from the Australian Open after missing only two shots. Well done. <laughs> okay, gentlemen, moving on. Now, I don't know how many of you peruse the confectionery aisles of Marks and Spencers. I'm, I'm quite the fan, but only a Percy Pig. Anything else? Not interested. However, there has been some controversy this week because Emanessa are renaming Midget Gems Mini Gems. Yes, that's the thing that has boiled people's piss this week. In a week with Boris Johnson, Novak Djokovic and Prince Andrew, this is the one thing, this is what the straw that broke the camel's back. And this all, this all stems from some, some research from um, Dr. Erin Pritchard from Liverpool Hope University. And, and I, I, I have this hard and fast rule on, on the ground forgets. Always have had it, always, always will have it. I'll, I'll happily have an opinion. But what, I, what I'll never do is talk over a community or for a community. We, we all started this to give disabled voices the platform they deserve to voice their opinion. So today I I reached out to Dr. Pritchard on Twitter 
I'm just like, hey, how's your week been? Like I didn't already know. Um, we do want to come on our podcast and <clears throat> and, and talk about this. We, I, I'd be really interested to hear how how this all started, but also to cut through some of the the inaccuracies that that happen on Twitter because Twitter is just like a, a minefield. Kind of, oh, it was just one person, or oh, how did she know this? The guy that asked about it on Newsnight didn't even know. She was from the restricted growth community. And so I think having her on to tell it straight is is a really good idea. So in any second now, I'm going to throw to future me in a different top. And we're, we're going to have it out. So in three, two, one, future Adam, go. And thank you, past us, for being so kind to future us on what is essentially still our podcast, just in the future. And as I said, we are joined now by Liverpool Hope University's very own Dr. Aaron Pritchard. Dr. Aaron Pritchard, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. And I hope you are too. I was going to say, quite quiet week, busy week. How 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 has it been? This week's quieter, much uh, a lot quieter. Things have calmed down a bit. I hope they, you know, remain the same now. Just, you know, everybody can stop being hysterical. And and this is the thing. So and we we sort of mentioned it in earlier in the podcast that this is all around M and S and just M and S, not like a global thing. Rebranding midget gems to mini gems off the back of your your campaigning. And there's been a lot of almost misinformation or assumptions made that this was just you writing a letter on on a whim. So I wanted to A, give you the chance to come on and, and correct the record, so to speak, and to cut through the hysteria with with facts. So how how did we get here? Back in 2014, I completed my doctoral research, which focused on the socio-spatial experiences of people with dwarfism. So I myself have dwarfism, but I actually went out and spoke to a, you know a lot of people with dwarfism, interviewed them. I also did a lot of background academic research. You know, even looked at some of what the associations were saying to get a broader view about dwarfism. And basically, one of the main findings was that the word midget is a very derogatory, very offensive term to use towards people with dwarfism due to its history, because it was um, popularised in the freak shows, due to its translation, which is that it's derived from the word midge or sandfly, so you're dehumanising people with dwarfism. The fact that it has no medical connotations, but it is used as a form of hate speech, and people might go, oh, no, it's not hate but it is literally screamed at people with dwarfism in the street. It's shouted at them. It's laughed, you know, when people are laughing at them, they go, oh, look, there's a midget, you know? So this is something that most people, and the vast majority of people with dwarfism who are proud of themselves, say, we no longer want to be called this. And so with those findings, I just, you know, contacted m and and says, this is a word that is offensive. I'm not saying you are trying to cause offence, but just reconsider the name of those sweets and about, you know, becoming more enlightened in the 21st century, because let's face it, you wouldn't have another dog to return for another minority group on a pack of sweets or any of your food items. I, I like what you said about it's kind of a derogatory term screaming at people in, in the street. And a lot of the, the arguments that have been put out there by um, the likes of, of Brendan O'Neill I want about kind of the uh, the context of language, mm-hmm. and and to a certain degree, I I don't think that matters. As someone who also has friends who have uh, dwarfism, um, whenever you hear that word shouted, it's never followed by anything nice. It's never shouted in a kind of oh look at that midget pause. I'm going to buy them lunch. <laughs> that never happens. So I, I really appreciate that you <clears throat> you kind of brought, brought that up. How have you found the response? Firstly, it's I'm not saying that people pick up a bag of midget gems and then think that there's free reign to then go and call a person with dwarfism a midget, but that it, that sweet, that product, it, this tangible object is normalising it. If people see it on ev- every day when they go shopping or whatever, it is normalising that word and saying it's acceptable when we should be saying it isn't. 
And like you say, yeah, on Twitter, people are, you know, probably called as a midget and stuff, average size men, average, some average size women who are never impacted by that word and feel free to then use it to really exemplify why it's important to get rid of that word because they're using it in a way of hate, as a form of hate. So it's just like, uh, you know, taking that, um, any other derogatory word and not using it in the media. And so why aren't we catching up with that? Because you wouldn't, you know, use another derogatory term to refer to another group of disabled people on a bag of sweets. So why, you know, a derogatory term associated with dwarfism? Can I ask, though, um, how did this all start? Where, uh, has it been on the pipeline for a while? You've seen it and you're wondering how to act? Or is it kind of you've seen it or people have approached you and said, could you maybe say something about this uh, as a community? We're, we're, we're offended that this word is still being used. How did it all start? It just started on my own initiative because of my research findings and in disability studies, it's about being proactive, it's about being you know, an activist, making change, because that's the only way you can make change for a lot of minority groups is through protest, through activism, which is why the Conservatives are trying to stop it, probably. But basically, associations for years, associations for dwarfism, they've been in their own echo chamber, they've said it's offensive, but they haven't really gone out and being proactive about it so I thought right you know what all it takes I'll just write a letter to MS. I know a couple of other dwarfs have written letters to maybe other companies and so that was what I did I thought we need to be changing this because I'm what you know I'm in my 30s now I think there's been no change whatsoever for people with dwarfism because we don't make that change and is another thing that gets thrown around uh, a lot in, in the wake of this and, and similar um, kind of campaigns and changes are terms like snowflake, SJW and, and cancel oh, culture. <laughs> and I, if people are online yelling about confectionery, who, who are the snowflakes here? And when did campaigning for social justice become something to be derived i i just don't don't get it how where, where do you stand on the whole kind of cancel culture fiasco i think it's just used by the media to you know because i had a man who had clearly re uh, read the daily mail article and then was messaged me saying i can't even wear a sombrero now because i've been told it's racist well we know we picked that up just like you know winterland for years is because of Muslims find Christmas offensive. It's made up rubbish to, you know, upset the general public. And then when you've got something like this, which is genuine, you know, because unlike the Daily Mail, I don't lie, you've got this like, oh, everybody's overreacting because, oh, a little bit of power's been taken away from you. No, it hasn't. Okay. It's just like Opal Fruits, like now Starburst or um, various names changed. That's all. And they changed a while back. It was only when the media got hold of it, certain right wing tabloids, that people became up in arms because they felt that their lives were being destroyed by um, a suite they probably haven't bought in years had changed its name. In one store so far. Yeah. In one store in as well. Store. Do you think it's a distraction from bigger issues to uh, move it away from those bigger issues so they aren't focusing on them? We've obviously got the rise in in many, many things. We've got fuel. Uh, we've got gas prices going up. We've got electricity. We've got um, council taxes on the rise. All of these things. And yet it, it kind of bewilders me that they focus on this. And the question that kept on coming up in my mind was, uh, how does it affect you? I, I I can't get my head around. Do you think it's a distraction the mainstream media are putting across so people aren't focusing on the bigger issues? Yeah, I think it, it probably is a part of the distraction. They're probably shocked because for the first time in, since when have, have people with dwarfism actually stood up and said this is offensive when for years we've just been nothing but a laughing stock to people because of a minority of people with dwarfism who think that they've got no pride in themselves. So, yeah, and I do think it's, it's like a slight distraction from the wider issue, just including, you know, um, the chance of the Exchequer wiping off uh, billions of pounds worth of fraud. Just, you know, what, several years ago, they were calling disabled people scroungers for claiming disability benefits. So I think it is that wider distraction and, you know, Boris going out partying and stuff when everybody else was in lockdown and possibly not being able to be near loved ones that they were losing to COVID. So yeah, it definitely is. And I think the media have done this just 
to Stoke Heights again and the vision. Well, Dr. Aaron Pritchard, thank you very much for your, your time today. I, I greatly appreciate it. And hopefully people who are, are watching this, listening to this, whatever platform they're consuming it on, can can take what you said and, and go away and do as much difficult soul searching as is as is necessary. But I, I completely echo what my colleague Chris said. Um basically if it doesn't apply, let it fly. Anyway, I'm gonna hand back now to past us to finish the rest of the show. So there we go, that was that was Dr. Aaron Aaron Pritchard. Um just just Briefly, do any of you have any thoughts on the the Magic Gems mini gems fiasco? I certainly think it doesn't take us any further away from equality, and I think if it helps a small community feel more integrated or or less shunned, I suppose, then it can only be only be a good thing. I think it's the gesture that goes with it that M and S were prepared to listen and do that. Actually, to me, says good things. It's like, regardless of what your thoughts are, oh, it shouldn't change or whatever else. The fact is, they've seen something that they don't like about one of their products, and that it is, you know, causing an offence to an, a section of the community. And if they can change that, what's the problem? I think it's good on M and S for agreeing. What's What's anybody losing? Yeah, there, there is no loss here. I, I never heard of Midget Gems. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I didn't know they existed, okay, uh, before it was in the news. And to be honest, when I saw it, because I do have friends who are who, ha who have dwarfism, I'm good friends with Sammy Davis, who's Warwick's wife. And, you know, I, I would say that it's so outdated... Uh, outdated so much. I remember. I remember having the, the, the getting a, seeing a Sun article from I think it was like the, the mid or uh, early nineties, and it was of Warwick and Sammy getting married, and they said Star Wars midget Warwick Davis gets married, and I was like, you know, so today's terminology that shouldn't exist. It should be Warwick Davis gets married. You don't need the word midget in there at all. It has no concept of it whatsoever. To change it. It doesn't make any take away from, it doesn't take away anything from the product. Well, and and when when Chris told me this, Simon, I nearly fell off my chair <laughs> because because <laughs> normally when we go, oh Simon, what is your news story? You're like, oh, I got trapped in little or or something something like that. <laughs> there but was no stable got... access for my walk of fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they won't, they won't let me skydive in a wheelchair. Motherfuckers, man. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it true you have good news? I wouldn't say I've got good news. I would say I've had good service. <laughs> so it's about the motability scheme. Who, for, for anyone who doesn't know what the motability scheme is, is if you've got personal independence payments or disability allowance or some kind of benefit that way, uh, at the higher rates, um, you are eligible to get yourself a motability car. This motability car can be adapted to your needs, and the adaptions are absolutely phenomenal on what they do, because I, I can't use my feet, so I've got to use hand controls, but people would like use discs on the floor and stuff, and have automatic boots and chairs coming out on the other side of the cars, and the scheme is... I think brilliant. It's probably one of the best in the world. I don't know of another country that does this. And uh, they do work with the government. They do get significant funding from the government as well. And you just apply for it. And obviously you qualify, you go down to a dealership and you select a car that is suitable for your needs. And for me and my wife, Kate, it's a godsend because we've got a hoist for our scooter for the wheelchair. Um, we've got uh, electric chairs that go back and forwards. We've got a steering wheel that goes up and down. I've got indicator switches on the sides and I've got push and pull hand controls. It is a daily essential for me to get out and about, okay? And for about three or four months now, I've had, well, I've had, a, I've had this car for about a year and a bit now and we've been having significant problems with it. And so we've been trying to get this sorted out and we've had the RSC out twice. We've been taken to two different Ford garages and they can't find the faults. But when the RSC came out, they found it and they couldn't fix it. And then we took it back to the garage and they couldn't do it. And so this has been going on for quite some time. And now uh, Motability said, well, 
we, we know you need a car and this is disrupting, disrupting, dis, disrupting your life. And it is because we've got to take it in. We've got to get the RSC out. We've had multiple calls. They've had it in for weeks. You know, it's just going on and on and on. And they just turned around to sit last week and said, look, this can't carry on. You work. You've got to go out and about. Okay, get a new car. It's just brilliant because it means that we can get our lives back on track. We can go out and about without worrying about breaking down or things getting into gear or hazard lights coming on and so on and so forth. So it's a good news story. And if it was this simple to replace a car, you know, for a charity scheme, I think it's just well worth mentioning. And I just want to say a big thank you to Motability who have taken on that. When I first made the complaint, they assigned it to a case manager. That case manager has been working me with some time and, and I'll stay with the same case manager for a long period of time. And yeah, it's just worked tremendously well. And it, I think when credit is due, credit is due. And it's not, it's very rare that you have an organization who will say, let's just get this sorted. So, well, there we are. So, Gold Royal Divinity, you get the golden thumbs up from the grumpy get. So, here's to you, <laughs> most ability people. Woo! I'm, I'm terrified to ask this question, Simon, unless you say something utterly ridiculous. What kind of car are you looking at? I am looking at a You are, you are. Um... Oh! I knew it. <laughs> Jeez. Oh. Yeah. Well, well, the thing is, as well, is I have to see if the adaptations can be put in the Tesla, first of all. And I think this will be an interesting scenario, is because I don't think a Tesla has had the adaptations done to as much as what I need doing to the car. Okay, so it'll be very interesting to see if a, if an organization like Tesla has actually put any thought in to having adaptations done to the car for disability. <laughs> I'm I'm all that's in the, on all my words. That's that's amazing. <laughs> hey, hey, Elon, how are you? Oh yeah, I'm I'm fine. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, can you make a Tesla wheelchair accessible? Well, I don't know. We we need to look at that. Can you put a fucking car on the moon? Oh yeah, yeah, rock and <laughs> rock and roll. <laughs> That brings us on to our final reoccurring segment. Chris Lee Smith, what is the ridiculous news story of the week? It's, uh, it's quite a painful one. So um, hold I'm on in. tight. I'm holding on. A beachgoer at Bondi Beach had his penis entirely degloved after being bitten by a dog. The aftermath were captured on camera as part of the Bondi Beach Rescue documentary series. The paramedics had never seen an injury like this as the dog ripped the skin from the base to the tip. Oh. The man required 100 stitches in hospital. Can I, can I, can I first say to this gentleman, if he's watching, 100 stitches, fucking good for you, buddy. <laughs> good, <night. laughs> good for you. I need 60, maybe 70. Like, well done, champ. You're forgetting well done. The, the dog ripped it off entirely, not like kind of one rip. I mean, this is all over. It, no. His his penis I mean, is probably eighty percent stitch at the moment. That's that's how bad it was. Can I ask, okay. What was the scenario that the dog was able to get to this so easily? Because <laughs> Bondi is not a nudist beach. I I, <laughs> I I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> I don't know. It didn't say in the article. I'm wondering if, if we go watch Bondi Rescue or whatever, uh, it, it may say, or he would have been lying about what he was actually doing. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's going to be arrested next week after the investigation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wonder if they put the dog into de de uh, doggy daycare. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh, I want to the dog particularly proud you should have seen it mate ripped the whole thing off <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to hear the i want to hear the dog side what i want that lady that's investigating boris i think this should be our next gig just find that dog and get his side of the story i'm wondering if the dog because you know what dogs are like i mean they get something in their mouth and they run off so i'm wondering if this guy had to chase the dog to get his skin back <laughs> down Bondi Beach and he's shouting at passers-by he's got my sleeve <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
risen sleeve on ice? Is that what happened? I don't know. I don't know. It didn't go into that much. We need to watch this. We need to watch it to find out. But yeah, some guy oh. with a blood stain on his he's, short he's, saying he's the, got the my dog's, skin. The, the dog's buried it under uh, buried it under a shellfish. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, just a man running down the beach going, Hey, you come back with my penis. <laughs> and then the coast guard's going, Oh, another one. Do they use the expandable stitching? Because that could be really painful. I don't know anymore, but we need to watch it. I, we need to find out what's going I want to on. I'm from the medical side. I'm, I'm so intrigued. I'm, I'm, oh, I really want to get all. You don't see that shit on Home and Away, do you? <laughs> can you imagine if that's the episode you're taking like a five year break, break from watching Home and Away and that's the episode you came back to <laughs> I'm like, say, in this episode no dogs were harmed in the filming of this episode <laughs> oh this is the best story you've done I'm so proud I'm so proud of you <laughs> just don't don't check my uh, google search history okay i had to i had to search <laughs> out for this one but, well the, there is one part that i left out it was a staffordshire bull terrier and i'm sure they've got locked jaw as well so that oh, must have been do. really difficult oh, to get that oh, to, mm. to oh well, yeah <laughs> i don't, I don't I, think I, he got angry not... i don't think he got angry to get that back i i bet he was in tears begging that dog to give it back <laughs> And with that, we come to the end of this show. And my God, was this a show? This is either our best episode or our worst episode. I'll leave it up to the audience to to decide on that one. And also, you can follow our lovely sponsors, Nadex at Nadex Show on Twitter. That's N A I D E X Show S H O W, all one word, on Twitter. You can see and the website, we'll have it up in the description. You can go straight to the website and register to attend as well. So, all that remains is to say goodbye. Thanks for watching, and as always, we love you. Be good. And if you can't be good, be lucky. And if you ever feel sad, remember, you have the same chances of winning the Australian Open as Novak Djokovic. <laughs> 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 <laughs>